So welcome back, everybody. Our second talk this afternoon is Baron Sternfels. Uh, Baron, I just learned, is recently ret retired from Berkeley and also is serving as the, the director of the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Uh, Bert's going to speak on algebraic varieties and quantum chemistry. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks for coming on a Friday afternoon. So uh, I'd like to tell you about a recent paper with this title, and the co-author is Swala, who is an early graduate student in Berkeley, and Fabian. So Fabian is here, so he's right there, and he's the person who actually knows about the application. So he's a numerical analyst who actually knows about the quantum chemistry. So uh, as the talk goes on, if there's any questions about algebraic varieties, they go to me. If there's any questions about quantum chemistry, they will go to Fabian. So let's start with a, a little bit of linear algebra. So I'm going to fix two positive integers, n bigger than d. And uh, I'm going to look at the vector space, the dth exterior power of r to the n. So r to the n, like every vector space I ever met, comes with a distinguished basis, e1, e2, up to en. And then by wedging them together here, we get the standard basis of this n choose d dimensional vector space. Now, the vectors in this vector space I'm going to write as column vectors denoted psi. I'm going to recall call them quantum states. So psi sub i is the ith coordinate, and i is a d element subset out of bracket n, which is the first n positive integers. Now, let's say a scientist walks into the door and gives me a symmetric n choose d by n choose d matrix with real entries. And uh, he or she calls this the Hamiltonian and asks us to solve the eigenvalue problem. So we'd like to, given h, find psi and lambda such that this equation holds. Well, you know, as a pure math student, pretty easy, right? We learned in uh, undergraduate linear algebra how to solve this problem. Um, so what's the difficulty? Well, the difficulty in the application is that the size of the matrix is very large. So the size of the matrix that we're given will be very, very large. And so the question is, what should you do when this is a very large matrix? So one approach to this that's uh, used in quantum chemistry is coupled cluster theory. And what this does, from my perspective, it takes a large problem of linear algebra, namely this large problem of linear algebra, and replaces it by a small problem of nonlinear algebra, of nonlinear equations. So introduction, so nonlinear algebra is also the name of our group at the Max Planck Institute, and for the students, here's a textbook invitation to nonlinear algebra. So I'm passing no judgment whether this is a good idea or not. Right? So all I'm saying is there's an established method to take a large linear algebra problem and approximate it by a small non, smaller nonlinear algebra problem. But what we will do is to provide tools for the practitioners to assess whether or not this is a good idea. So a few words about math. So a title from the abstract from the paper. So we develop an algebraic geometric methods for coupled cluster theory, CC theory of quantum, quantum many bottom systems. Uh, the background is the uh, electronic Schrodinger equation. I'll show you what that is. And we're going to approximate it by a hierarchy of systems of polynomial equations. Um, the exponential parametrization will be explained, and this leads us to the Grassmannian and its Plucke embedding. And up there on the fourth floor of the Harvard Math Lounge, where there's two next to each other excellent coffee machines, you look at the blackboard, you saw this equation of the blackboard, but I'm not going to call the Plucke coordinates P, I'm going to call them Psi in this talk, right, because of these uh, connection to, to quantum theory. So for example, the Grassmannian G24 of two-dimensional vector subspaces in a four-dimensional space, well, it's the, uh, given by this equation, psi 1, 2, psi 3, 4, and so on equals zero. So this is the unique uh, irreducible relation that holds among the two by two subdeterminants of a two by four matrix. And the solution represents the row space of such a matrix. 
We'll also do, we're also going to have a digression where we discuss how these Hamiltonians H are actually derived. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about how to solve the coupled cluster equation. So this is the welcome slide about the math. Now, this is called math and science, almost the name of our Max Planck Institute. So here's a slide about science. So this is from the introduction. So electronic structure theory is a powerful quantum mechanical framework, well, that investigates electron-electron interaction and within molecules and, and, and crystals. Um, so this is a very, very big story, which has lots of applications in chemistry, material sciences, has a lot of potential for the mathematical sciences, and we believe that uh, geometry and algebra is relevant because it can lead to the development of methods that are both precise and scalable. And of course, this could have societal implications that I mentioned here. So summarizing the synergy between fundamental math and electronic structure theory offers potential for groundbreaking advances in addressing these challenges. Okay, so that's the promising sounding science part. Let's get back to our linear algebra. So, uh, in fact, I like to have two copies of my vector space. So here's our n choose d dimensional vector space, whose vectors I call quantum states, called h. And the first basis vector, e sub d, I'm going to call the reference state. So recall bracket d is the set 1, 2, up to d. So this is the first basis vector. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, long column vector, 1, 0, 0, 0. Now there's a second uh, copy of the same vector space where the elements are called x and called cluster amplitudes. And the exponential parametrization is a nonlinear bijection between these two vector spaces. So I have these two vector spaces of the same dimension, and I can map cluster amplitudes to quantum states. And the rule will be like this. I'm going to take the x, the cluster amplitude, I stick it in the matrix, I take the exponential of the matrix, and then I extract the first column vector of that square matrix, which is equivalent to multiplying with the, uh, the first basis vector. Now, in this exponential parametrization, T of x is a strictly lower triangular matrix. The entries of this matrix, each entry is either 0 or plus or minus one of the coordinates. So k, again, is a d element subset of 1, 2, up to n. Right? So I simply write my coordinates plus or minus strictly below the diagonal in this matrix. So therefore, t is a nilpotent matrix. And in particular, we'll have the d plus first power of this matrix will be the 0 matrix. Now, the matrix exponential is simply you take the uh, Taylor series for the exponential, you stick in the matrix, out comes a matrix. Now, this converges, but here, nothing much to converge, right? Because higher powers are zero anyways. So the exponential function here is a polynomial function. And then uh, since t is nilpotent, the exponential is idempotent. Appropriate power is the identity matrix. And the entries are polynomials in x of degree d. Now let's see an example. So for example, d is 2 and n is 5. Then the T matrix looks like this. So it's a strictly lower triangular matrix. And every non-zero entry is either plus or minus for the cluster amplitudes. The, uh, the rows and columns of this symmetric, symmetric matrix are indexed by the pairs, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. 1, 5, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 3, 4, 3, 5, 4, 5. Now the exponential you see has uh, all ones on the diagonal, right? So this is the idempotent matrix. And then here you have linear entries, and down there you have some inhomogeneous quadratic entries, right? So, so this is the T matrix, and here the, uh, I guess the cube is all zero, and here the appropriate power is the identity matrix, a nilpotent, uh, idempotent. So these are our two matrices, and we're going to be interested in the first column vector of this matrix. 
Okay, so here's the uh, precise definition. So the entries in a, in a given row and column, so J and I are D element subset over one up to N. So the entry in row J and column I is either zero and it's non-zero precisely when everybody who is in I but not in J is in the first D indices and everybody who's in J but not in I is in the last N minus D indices, right? So the things in I but not in J should be early and the things in J but not in I should be late. And if that is so, well, then there's a K that you construct that you take a bracket D, throw in J, take out I, and up to sign, this will be our entry, and there is a combinatorial defined sign. There's a rule how to put plus or minus. Now I need to define one more thing, which is the level of a coordinate. So each psi coordinate or each x coordinate has a level, and by the level I mean the cardinality of i minus d. So for example, if d is 3 and n is 6, then the level can either be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Well, each of these has 20 coordinates, so the quantum states has 20 coordinates, the cluster amplitude has 20 coordinates, there's one coordinate of level zero, right? There are nine coordinates of level one, right? So level one means the intersection with one, two, three has one element, and then level two, there are also nine, and finally in this example, there's one coordinate of level three, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna order, label the rows and columns of my matrices increasing by level. That's already, I've done that in this example, we're gonna do that in general. You can see the level here. The quadratic entries here occur in level two. Here you have linear entries in level one, and here you have the constant in level zero. Let's make this even more explicit. So we're talking about the exponential parametrization. Again, this is a map between our two vector spaces, and psi is the first column of the exponential of t of x. So very explicitly, here are the formulas for psi as polynomials in the x's um, for d equals three and n equals six. So starts very easy. Psi is plus or minus x at level one. Then at level two, psi is a quadratic in x. At level three, psi is a cubic with 16 terms in x. Now you look at this, I claim that this was invertible and you can see this is a triangularized system, right? You can invert this and write the x's in terms of psi's, right? Easily here, x is psi. Then here you bring the quadratic stuff on the other side, but what you bring over has lower level, right? And then that already is in terms of psi. So down here, x456 is this one minus all the other stuff, but the other stuff has lower level. So therefore, you can solve for the x's in terms of the psi's. So that summarized proposition. So the map, this polynomial map has a, a polynomial inverse, namely xi, the uh, cluster amplitude is, a is equal to plus or minus psi i plus a polynomial and psi coordinates of strictly lower level. And here I've solved these equations for you. Here you can see there are some integers like two occurring among the coefficients, okay? So I can go back and forth. If you know probability or statistics, it's a little bit like the transformation between cumulants and moments, right? So you have a, a nonlinear transformation. We have a distinguished coordinate that's one, just like with cumulants and, and, and moments. And so we're working in this affine space, and we have a polynomial bijection. Now here's my first slide on combinatorics. I know a couple combinatorialists in the audience, right? So, uh, so I claim all of these polynomials are roughly the same, right? Once you know this polynomial, then you know all the quadratic polynomials. They're all the same up to relabeling. So all the quadratic polynomials are the same up to relabeling. All the cubic polynomials are the same up to relabeling. So let me introduce a master polynomial. So in this case, n is twice d and capital I is the, uh, the largest level variable, bracket 2D minus D, and uh, here explicitly, right? So here we have the quadratic master polynomial, the cubic with 16 terms, 
the quartic with the 131 terms and so on. And then you write this down, you count the number of terms in the master polynomial and you get the sequence. Now, of course, if you see a positive integer sequence, you type it into the online encyclopedia and you get a hit. And uh, this has been studied by uh, people in algebraic combinatorics, in fact, quite recently. So uh, let's first say this works both ways. So all coordinates of the inverse map also get, come from relabeling by an inverse master polynomial. And the theorem uh, says that we have explicit formulas for these polynomials as integer linear combinations of monomials. And these are labeled by what's called uniform block permutations. And there are some coefficients here. You see happily 6 and 24, right? So uh, this is fairly recent work by Orellana and others. So there's a combinatorial structure called uniform block permutations. There's a Hopf algebra structure on this. Uh, and these things index uh, all these terms and their coefficients, okay? So we know both for the forward map and for the backward map, we know the coordinates very explicitly uh, thanks to uh, existing technology from combinatorics. Now the title of the talk is Algebraic Varieties in Quantum Chemistry. So now let me define the varieties we're looking at. I'm gonna fix a non-empty proper subset of one up to D called sigma. Then I'm gonna look at the coordinate linear subspace given by the coordinates whose level is in sigma. So I'm prescribing which level I'm gonna look at. I'm gonna truncate to a certain level. I'm gonna restrict my exponential parameterization to that coordinate linear subspace. So these are all the coordinates whose level is in sigma. And I'm gonna look at the image of this restriction under this map. Now maybe I should digress for 30 seconds. Now we do what we always do in applied algebraic geometry. We have some problem that has real numbers and polynomial equations, inequalities. We simplify this in three steps. Step one, throw out all inequalities. Only look at the equations. Step two, replace the real numbers by the complex numbers. Now that makes the problem easier. Now polynomials have roots, right? Third step, replace affine space by projective space. That makes it easier. Now any two lines in the plane will meet, okay? So after these three simplification steps, we're now happily in complex projective space, and maybe the problem is so easy that even an algebraic geometer might be able to make a contribution. But of course, we wanna come back ultimately and say something with, about real numbers with inequality. So, so with that in mind, we're looking at this truncation variety in complex projective space. So this is in the projectivization um, of our first vector space V. So this is a complex projective space of dimension N choose D minus one. Now we already know the dimension, right? Our vectors, our variety is the image of a linear space under an invertible map, right? We have a polynomial map with polynomial inverse, so therefore the dimension of the variety is exactly the same as the dimension of the linear space, and this is the number of all coordinates that have prescribed level, that is to say the level is in sigma, okay? So this is the sigma truncation variety. Okay, so let's do a few examples, right? So let's say d equals three, n equals six, so there are six, subsets, proper subsets of a three element set here in green. And so we have six truncation varieties. They live in a projective space of dimension 19, which is six choose three minus one. Now three of my truncation varieties are actually linear spaces. They're just linear spaces. So V sub singleton two is a nine dimensional subspace. It's a zero set of all the coordinates of level one and three. Similarly, V23 is a 10-dimensional space, and then the V sub 3 is a line, a P1. Now, more interestingly, the, uh, the nonlinear truncation varieties occur for sigma 1, 2. In this case, it's the cubic hypersurface defined by a homogeneous cubic polynomial with 16 terms, namely the homogenized master polynomial, right? So I take the master polynomial, 
with its 16 terms, and I homogenize it with the first coordinate. Then there's V13. Well, it's a 10-dimensional variety cut out by 25 quadratic equations. And last but not least, there's V sub singleton 1, which is the Grassmannian 3,6, so the vitals of the Grassmannian. There's dimension 9, degree 42, and 35 quadrics. And uh, we didn't see all 35 quadrics on the fourth floor, but we could have. Now, let me first tell you how to compute the equations in general for the truncation variety. So my interest in math is to understand the zeros of polynomials and to explore applications in various settings. So, so what are these polynomials? Well, the restriction of V to distinguished affine chart is a complete intersection. And it's simply defined by the vanishing of all uh, cluster amplitudes whose level is not in the prescribed set, right? So I restrict to uh, the prescribed sigma coordinates, and then I make the others vanish. So this gives us a description on the affine space. But of course, we want to do this in projective space. So just like in the undergraduate textbook, ideals, varieties, and algorithms, we have to saturate by the distinguished coordinates. And this gives us the homogeneous prime ideal of the truncation variety. The second theorem on this slide is how to be linear, right? We saw in our example that three times this was a linear space, three times it was not a linear space. So how can we see from the set sigma whether this is a linear space? Well, the truncation variety is a linear subspace if and only if the set sigma is additively closed. So additively closed means if i and j are in sigma and if they're sum, is not beyond D, then also the sum is in sigma. So that's what I mean by an additively closed subset. So you can see these things are additively closed. For example, the singleton two is additively closed because two plus two, four is beyond three. But down here, these are not additively closed. For example, one, two is not additively closed because one plus two equals three is not in the set. Okay? So to be a linear space means to be additively closed. I promise that my varieties generalize the Grassmannian. So here is the uh, result. So if uh, sigma is the singleton one, then the uh, truncation variety is precisely the Grassmannian in its Plucker embedding. So therefore, the uh, truncation varieties are generalizations of the Grassmannian, right? So for every subset sigma, I have a variety at the bottom for the singleton one is the Grassmannian, but then I have a, you know, a cascade of varieties that generalize the Grassmannian. Now Grassmannians have a duality, right? So as a duality between D-dimensional linear spaces and co-dimension D linear spaces, so this also generalizes. So we're fixing our truncation set sigma, then there's a linear isomorphism between two copies of our ambient space, which switches the dn version of the truncation variety with the n minus d n version of the truncation variety. Right? So just like you have the duality between the dn Grassmannian and the n minus dn Grassmannian, the same happens for every fixed sigma, not just sigma being the single. OK, maybe. Uh, Couple more examples just to kind of get a sense of this. So if D is three and N is seven, again, there are six proper subsets of a three element set. Again, we have the, uh, the linear cases. So for each variety, I write the dimension. How many degrees of freedom do you have? The degree, how curvy are you? And then here, the, uh, the equation, so minimal generators of the ideal, so linear, quadratic, and so on. And then there's an orange quantity that I'll come to. It's called the couple cluster degree. So for example, for the Grassmannian, G37, it's a 12-dimensional variety of degree 462, no linear equations, but 140 quadratics, all looking like the equation we saw on the board on the fourth floor. 
Then here for two, for the ones that are additively closed, we have these linear spaces, and then for one, two, and one, three, we have some others. Here's the D equals four, N equals eight case. So now eight choose four is 70. So now we're living in a projective space of dimension 69. There are 14 proper subsets sigma of a four element set. Five of them are, give us linear spaces for the additively closed subsets. And then here are all the others, the Grassmannian. And then uh, these are all the, the nine nonlinear ones. You can see the degrees of these varieties go up quite a bit. They go up to almost 500,000. And then I'm going to get to the coupled cluster degrees in a moment. And there's still some question marks in this row. OK, so here are now the equations we want to solve. What we're going to do is we're going to take the eigenvector equation, h psi equals lambda psi. Recall psi is an unknown long column vector. I'm going to truncate this to all the variables whose level is in sigma. Right? So I have this long column vector. I'm just going to erase many of the entries. I only keep those entries where the index has a level in sigma. I'm doing this both on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So now I've erased many, many equations out of the eigenvector equation. That means now the solution is no longer finite. It's a very big solution space. But now I'm going to require that the eigenvector psi or the eigenpoint be in the truncation variety. Right? So the, the gain in dimension up here is made up by the loss of dimension down there. And this is now, again, a well-posed system a finitely, which has finitely many solutions in projective space. So I want to define the coupled cluster degree with this notation CC. This depends on D and N on sigma. It's the number of complex solutions in projective space of this system for generic symmetric matrices H. And uh, here we take real, but you could also take complex. And uh, this is the system we want to solve. So this is the truncation variety I introduced. And we're going to replace the original eigenvector equation by this nonlinear system. So the nonlinearity is here in the truncation variety. And I gave you, in precise terms, the equations that cut out the truncation variety. So now when we started walking, talking with, with Fabian, I said, that's all very nice, but my audience are, you know, algebraists, maybe combinatorialists that they might want to know where does H actually come from? What does all of this mean? So I'm going to digress now. I'll talk a little bit about where H comes from. Then we're going to get to Mike's question, and we're going to maybe Fabian can make a comment. And uh, I'll very, very slowly go like this and give this to you. So the context is the electronic Schrodinger equation, which is now on the screen. So psi, now capital psi, is an unknown function in 3D unknowns. So I'm going to write r sub i, lowercase r sub i, for the unknown position of the ith electron in a system of d electrons. And so psi is a function of those positions. H will be a certain differential operator. And lambda is against a constant. So we're going to be interested in the eigenfunctions of this differential operator. Now, we're going to assume that psi is skew-symmetric. This follows from Pauli's exclusion principle. And this differential operator looks like this. I'm starting out with the Laplacian, the sum of the Laplacians. So delta, yes. Oh, oh skew-symmetric, I simply mean the sign changes if R, I, and okay, alternating. Yeah, so alternating, skew-symmetric, I mean alternating. So, so if I have, I have this function psi, if I replace, if I switch R, I with R, J, then the sign changes. Okay, that's all I'm going to assume. Um, okay, so delta R, I is the Laplacian in the three coordinates of R sub I. And I'm adding up, so this is, you know, the coordinates are x, y, z, so partial x squared plus partial y squared plus partial z squared. And so this is a constant coefficient linear partial differential operator. 
Then I have these two other sums, and they just operators that act by multiplication. Very simple. So here we have one more ingredient, capital R sub J is a fixed position of the jth nucleus. So this system has electrons and nuclei, and R sub J is fixed. Okay? Now Z sub J is a positive integer. It's called the nuclear charge, and this is the number in the periodic table. Right? So for me, it's been 40 years, more, 45 years until I last looked at the periodic table. So up here, you have hydrogen, number one. Then there's a long row, and then there's helium over there. And then under hydrogen, you have lithium, and this goes on. Okay? Now, there are more things at the bottom, right? So for many years, I was in Berkeley. So they have an element called berkelium, right? I was a student in Darmstadt. Further down, they have an element called helium, uh, called, called Darmstadtium. But these things don't last very long. Okay? So this is basically how the periodic table looks like. And Z sub J is the position. So here, D nuke is the number of nuclei. And we're simply uh, penalizing the, the distance Ri minus Rj, the, diff, the distance from the ith electron to the jth nucleus. It already has the, oh, I see. Maybe we need one. Okay, Fabian, you're on. Yes, sir. So I assume you're in a crystal, that's why the IJs are fixed? The molecule. But why are they fixed? I mean, oh, it just, you're doing, dealing with respect to the molecule. It's like a, okay. 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 But these electrons, they float around, right? So we're still also penalizing the lower R case Ri minus lower case Rj. Okay, so this is the differential operator. Now the other thing there should be, uh, we shouldn't have more nuclei than electrons, right? So D nook should be less or equal to D, and then D is also the sum of these Cj's from the periodic table. And I said, Fabian, let's do an example. Okay? he said, well, there's an example in the literature, the hydrogen atom has been solved analytically. Now, I always get a little uncomfortable when an engineer or scientist talks about analytic solutions. Right? That suggests that analysis is a very useful subject of math, which it is. But more often than not, they mean algebraic. Right? So when people say analytic solution, they really mean algebraic solution. Right? So we have a nice algebraic solution for the hydrogen atom having to do with spherical harmonics and so on. I said, no, Fabian, there should be more than one atom. So we opted for lithium hydride. So this is the molecule LiH. So it has two atoms, lithium number three, hydrogen number one. So D is four. Three for lithium, one for hydrogen. So D is four. Now, the two nuclei are lo locations R1 capital and R2 capital, and then there are four electrons with variable notation locations, and psi is an unknown function of scalar, 12 scalar unknowns, namely the coordinates of the electrons, and this is skew-symmetric, or what Frank would say, alternating. Now we have to get from this infinite dimensional scenario to our finite dimensional linear algebra problem. So we need to discretize. And we do this by restricting the Hamiltonian, the differential operator, to a k-dimensional space of nice functions. So the functions we're looking at from R3 to R, and the k should be at least d. Now where do we find these nice functions? Well, chemists have been doing this for a long time, so there's a website. So we can, for example, go to this website and download k of these functions. They're called atomic orbitals. We're going to call them chi k, chi 1 up to chi k. So they come from a long history of chemistry going back to the analytic, whoops, algebraic solution for the hydrogen atom. And then you get pictures like this. So you've seen this in high school, right? So this is a way of depicting such a function, negative values in red. Um, positive values in blue. So this is a depiction of functions chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, chi 4 from 3 space to R downloaded from an appropriate website. 
Now, there's one more thing, namely we need to double the number of functions. So we have to take those four atomic orbitals and turn them into twice as many, eight molecular orbitals. And this has to do with electronic spin. So spin can be up or down, and each function has an up flavor and a down flavor. So at the end of the day, we have eight functions of a lithium hydride. We have D equals four and N equals eight. And then uh, here's a depiction of these molecular orbitals. Now this is the last slide. Now we have to do some computing. We have to do some numerical computing. The goal is to fill a symmetric 70 by 70 matrix with floating point real numbers. Well, we have our eight molecular orbitals, so Xi1 up to Xi8. And uh, this has an inner product space. So there's an inner product that's obtained by just integrating these functions. There's a slight modification having to do with spin that I suppress here. Then this gets wedged together. So these functions make skew symmetric, that is to say alternating functions by wedging them together. So we get the N choose D basis, this is referred to as a Galerkin basis, where I again indexes D subsets out of one up to N. Now we have to lift our inner product from the small space to the big space. So the inner product on the big space is defined by symmetrizing. So we're add, summing here over the symmetric group, permuting the entries of I, permuting the entries of J, and then otherwise we just multiply values of the previous integrals to make it, <coughs> to get the inner product. Now we're done, right? So now we compute the entries of our discretized matrix by evaluating this integral. This integral boils down to, this expression boils down to these integrals. And then now the entry in row I and column J is this inner product, where in the second factor we're applying our differential operator. So summary for lithium hydride, the Hamiltonian is a symmetric 77, 70 by 70 matrix that we filled in this manner with floating point real numbers. Okay, so now maybe, sorry, there was a question earlier on about the meaning of all this. Could, would you mind repeating? I was wondering where the magnetic field was. I was wondering why the original that uh, <coughs> field was R instead of C. R versus C, Fabian. So, so there's no explicit external magnetic field. Well, well, what I meant was the foundations for this study seem to be N electrons in D orbitals. That's if correct. I wanted to write such a function, I'd use this formalism, except I never would have written down a real vector space. I would have started with a complex vector space because the amplitudes for each of those configurations, uh, naively are complex numbers. So I thought the answer was that you were only considering time reversal symmetry. No, you, you could do it over C, but we made our life a bit easier in using R in, in the application because what you want in the end is real valued energy because we don't have, um, we don't have an external field. It's just the clamp, the field induced by the clamp nuclei. And that solution is- In orbit coupling? Real Hmm? Spin orbit coupling? There's no spin orbit coupling in the electronic Schrodinger equation. Well, there could be coupling between the spin of the nucleus and the That spin is correct. There is, there is this coupling in nature, but this model does not include the spin orbital coupling. Okay. Okay. Folks, you can also ask math questions. So Chiara, Gabriel, like, you know, what's a prime ideal and things like that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let, let, let's go on. Um, Okay, we're back now. So now after, this, uh, now after this digression, now we know where these matrices H come from, right? They're, they're computed from this mechanism that we described, and this is the system of polynomial equations we want to solve, right? So the unknowns are the entries of Psi, uh, N choose D of them. We do this on the projective variety whose prime ideal I gave you. And then we're solving the eigenvector, truncated eigenvector equation. We're truncating it to all those coordinates whose have a prescribed level, whose level is in sigma. Let's look at an example. Right? So in matrix formulation, let's do this for the example we start out with, where D is 2 and N is 5. 
and sigma is the singleton one. So this is the Grassmannian 2-5, okay? So I learned a couple hours ago from Amanda that this is a rank two cluster algebra, so let's do it for this rank two cluster variety. So now the Grassmannian itself is cut out by five Plücker relations, five of them that, we, that I sang aloud. We can also think about them as the four by four subfafians of a five by five skew symmetric matrix like this, right? So these subfafians are the square roots of the four by four principal minors. So the Grassmannian is given by saying that the rank of this matrix is at most two. And then I have the eigenvector equations. Well, let me eliminate the lambda. So I'm saying this column vector is parallel to this column vector. So I like the, set, the left vector is this column vector of length seven. This vector is this column vector of length seven. So remember, sigma is one. So we're truncating to coordinates of level zero. They come for free. And then there are six coordinates of level one. And we're throwing out the three coordinates of level three. And they are supposed to be parallel. So the rank of this seven by two matrix is at most one. This is a Segre variety. And uh, this Grassmann has dimension six. This gives us co-dimension six. So there are finitely many solutions for random or generic H. So the Hamiltonian here is a 10 by 10 matrix. And the number of solutions, this is what we call the coupled cluster degree. And this example is 27. And uh, for reference, 27 is two times 14 minus one. Now this notion of degree is quite common and Frank can confirm this in applied algebraic geometry. We have maximum likelihood degree, ML degree in statistics. We have ED degree, Euclidean distance degree and you know, distance optimization. So these are measures, algebraic methods for the intrinsic algebraic complexity of solving a nonlinear system of equations. Expected number, this is the number of paths we need to track in a homotopy method the number of solutions for generic data. Let's shed a little bit of light on this uh, 27. So uh, first of all, here's a general upper bound. So the coupled cluster degree is bounded above by Bezu's theorem. On the one hand, I have the degree of the truncation variety, whatever it is, and I'm multiplying it by the degree of our little Segre variety, right? So the degree of the Grassmann in this case times the degree coming here, and the degree of this is simply um, the number of rows plus one, right? So this is the dimension of V plus one. So recall this is the number of uh, coordinates whose level is in sigma. Now this inequality is generally strict, right? So in our example case, the Grassmannian has degree five, the Segre has degree seven, the product is 35, but we saw it was 27. Now the only case where this holds with equality is the linear space case. So V sigma is a linear space. That is to say, if sigma is additively closed, then uh, we have equality. Well, this is one, and then the equality holds. And in this case, the coupled cluster equations are really just the usual eigenvalue problem for the upper left block given by sigma. So I take my big matrix. I simply look at the upper sigma sigma block in this matrix, and I simply have the usual eigenvalue problem over the real number, a symmetric matrix, and therefore all complex solutions are real. So this is the uninteresting case where the uh, truncation variety is a linear space. In all other cases, we have this general bound. Now, another slide of combinatorics. So uh, let's look at the case where D is two and uh, sigma is N. So uh, in this case, the degree of the Grassmannian is well known to be the Catalan number. Right? So the Catalan numbers are going 2, 5, 14. And books have been written about the hundreds of interpretations of the Catalan numbers are written by Richard Stanley. So uh, this is the Catalan number. And the way the indexing goes, I take this to be the n minus second Catalan number. Well, this is actually a lie. This was on Wednesday. So, uh, well, the CC degree of the Grassmannian 2n is known, and it's uh, two times the next Catalan number minus one. Right? So this was the two times 14 minus one on the previous slide. Um, that can be written like this. 
And uh, this was still conjectured. So in the previous paper with Fabian and Swala earlier this summer, this was a conjecture, but uh, thanks to the help of another brilliant graduate student, Victoria, um, we just put out a new paper, a largely combinatorics paper that proves this conjecture. So uh, in this case, we know the exact uh, degree and uh, this is, uh, involves Gröpner degenerations and Hovansky bases in, in this case. Here again, just to compare the bound, this is the, bo the bound that we get from the upper bound and the CC degree here is always twice the next Catalan number minus one. So 83 is two times 42 minus one. Now there is one more case where we uh, know the exact value very well, and that's the case of the uh, master hypersurface, right? So the master hypersurface arises if n is two times d, and sigma is everything except for d. So I take the uh, truncation to the first d minus one uh, positive integers. So in this case, the upper bound almost holds; it's off by d minus one. So uh, in this case, the couple cluster degree is the upper bound minus this correction, and this evaluates to this expression. And this is the situation when the truncation variety is a hypersurface. So it's the hypersurface whose equations we know exactly thanks to uh, the combinatorial results I cited earlier. So with that in mind, let's revisit the uh, situation for d equals three. So in n equals six, so there are six truncation varieties in P19. So here's the Grassmannian. So the Grassmannian here for three, six has coupled cluster degree 250. And then this hypersurface is this column. So it's an 18 dimensional variety in P19. It's defined by a cubic. The upper bound is 57, three times 19. But then the true answer is 55. And we're gonna come back to the number 55 in a moment. Now our work is actually a continuation. So Fabian approached us. And so he wrote an earlier paper with the collaborator Matthias Oster that's uh, gonna appear shortly in the SIAM um, journal on applied algebra and geometry called Klappert Cluster Theory towards an algebraic geometry formalism. So coupled cluster theory exists for a long time in the computational chemistry literature, but uh, in this paper, they made a first, took first interesting steps moving this more towards algebraic geometry. And I wanna just argue a little bit that the work I'm presenting here is, is further progress. So in section six, uh, they talk about the CCSD model. So this is the notation the chemists use, so CC, stands for coupled cluster singles doubles. So C, C, S, D. In our notation, this is simply sigma is one, two. So singles one, doubles two. For three electrons and six spin orbitals, so this is the three, six situation. And they wrote that uh, in this model supersedes the ability of state-of-the-art algebraic geometry software. So in their theorem 4.10, they offered an upper bound. So they use not only Bezu's theorem, but also Bernstein's theorem to give an upper bound. And for this case, they gave this upper bound for the number of complex solutions, two to the 27, which is this uh, nine digit number. Now we know from the previous slide that it's 55. Right? So what I'm trying to say is that the analysis, the algebraic and combinatorial analysis not only drops the upper bound, but it gives us the exact number, right? So we, we know in many cases the exact number, and this is a huge difference, right? Because this means it's a polynomial system that's very easy to solve. Now, connecting this to the literature, it turns out that the formulation I gave as a restricted eigenvalue problem on the truncation variety is not always the same as the classical formulation in the chemistry literature, but almost always an interesting situation. So our formulations, the one I presented, is equivalent to the classical formulation, for example, which was used in this Siaga paper, if and only if sigma is an arithmetic progression. So arithmetic progression means that our truncation set has this form, m, 2m, 
up to some km, uh, which is not bigger than d. Now, it turns out that uh, all the interesting cases that were covered in the computational chemistry literature satisfy these hypotheses. So, singles, singleton 1, CCD, just singleton 2, or 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3, those are all arithmetic progressions. So, whenever we have an arithmetic progression, then our formulation is precisely the one that uh, is also used in the chemistry literature, otherwise they deviate a little bit. So, well, as I said, this has been long studied. There's a vast literature, and just as a sample, here's one paper from 2000, so complete set of solutions of multi-reference coupled cluster equations, physical review A. Now, the advance now is both the conceptual one and the computational one. So, I think we have a better understanding of modeling interesting physical applied situations using algebraic geometric description. And we now have numerical algebraic geometry. We have the capability of solving medium-sized systems of polynomial equations exactly with certification. So this is really a, a big difference from what was done 20, 30 years ago. So let me end by uh, talking about numerical solutions. I think uh, computation is very important. I think and we have a center that... Uh, deals with uh, mathematical sciences and applications. We should not forget the importance of uh, computation um, for the sciences uh, as a medium for us to communicate with sciences. So let me uh, talk a little bit about how to solve these equations. And we use the software called homotopycontinuation.jl. So this is a software written in Julia. Julia is a platform that numerical analysts tend to use. So Old people use MATLAB, young people use Julia, developed down the street at MIT. So uh, this particular package is due to Briding and Timmer, and together with Rosa, they have a certification. So there is a software based, uh, so this software comes with the extra button where you click, and when you run the calculation, you can ask for certification. Using interval arithmetic, you get a proof that this was correct. So, for example, d equals 3, n equals 8. So, some examples. So, in each case, here we have, again, our subsets. Let's focus on the nonlinear case, so the Grassmannian, 3, 8 Grassmannian, sort of a threshold case, you know, for the cluster people, you know, last finite type case. So, the degree of the Grassmannian is 6,006. The coupled cluster degree is 38,600. So it takes uh, about 10 minutes to uh, find all 38,000 solutions, and it takes seven seconds to certify it. So this is off-the-shelf standard software. But then, of course, you know, as the, uh, as the couple cluster degree increases you know, in the hundred thousands, then it takes a little longer both to solve and to certify. Now, scientists like figures, right? If you look at a scientific paper, especially in science and nature, very prominently you will uh, find the figures, and then the more interesting mathy things are usually in the uh, supplementary materials. So we made a couple figures. So first of all, to sort of show the progress relative to a previous bounds, right? So this is much, much better. But more interestingly, really a comparison of the energy spectra. So we, used to, we looked at our lithium hydride example. So here D was 4, N was 8. So this was a 70 by 70 Hamiltonian matrix. So we can easily compute the true real eigenvalues. So there's a true spectrum here indicated in red. And then, of course, over the complex numbers, uh, some of the, the roots are non-real. So they come in conjugate pairs. But you can see that in the dominant part here, there's a lot of agreement, uh, in particular for the single truncation, sigma equals one. We have very good agreement, and here it's a little bit worse. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here, we did a couple more. So this is again lithium hydride for d equals four, n equals eight. So uh, what I'm concluding here is I'm not saying that couple cluster theory. I'm agnostic as a West, whether this is a good approximation or not. What I'm saying is, thanks to the advances in computation algebraic geometry, we can now offer the scientists a tool to make this judgment. 
So we're not making the judgment, is this a good approximation or not, but we offer new tools that uh, can be used to make such a judgment. Turns out that uh, this is actually highly singular. The specific Hamiltonians that we derive in our calculation leads to a lot of singular solutions. So one interesting problem is to still understand what's special about these matrices H that come in the manner described from the electronic Schrodinger equation. Okay, it's Friday afternoon. Time is up. Nobody minds a talk that ends a minute early. So let me conclude. So these are the polynomial equations that we wanted to solve, the couple cluster equations. Um, I argued that algebraic geometry and combinatorics are valuable essential ingredients for mathematics and science. I claim that polynomial equations where we know ahead of time that the number of complex solutions in the order of 100,000 can now be solved routinely with proof, okay? with certification, very important. Now, everybody, I claim, loves the Grassmannian, right? Who could argue with that? We all like linear subspace over vector space. And once you see Catalan numbers, you cannot help but falling in love with them. I claim that quantum chemistry offers very interesting problems like many sciences, right? So we would like to look at the sciences, maybe make a contribution, but equally easy bring it back and turn a scientific question into math, theoretical math. Now the last comment is that the equations up there in fact make sense for any projective variety whatsoever, right? So if you have your favorite projective variety and you have a basis of the algebraic matroid, that is to say you have a set of coordinates that's maximal and independent on the variety. So you fix a projective variety together with a basis of its algebraic matroid then you can write down these equations and we can define and study the coupled cluster degree. With that, I thank for your attention.